Yeah, this is Exodus 27 through 11. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless and taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord thy God. In it, shall, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor the maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger, that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Well, you know, as we uh, go through these commandments, um, we uh, mentioned last week uh, that uh, they are called commandments. They're not ten good suggestions to consider. They are ten commandments to uh, obey. And uh, we sort of live in an era when, uh, you know, we don't like anybody to command anything. And, uh, and, and, and sometimes, you know, even when God says, well, these are commandments, we say, well, you know, could we, uh, you know, could we negotiate a little bit uh, on this? Uh, but God says, no, no, these, these are not negotiables, okay? These are obey commandments. So uh, one of the things that uh, happens uh, is sometimes we read through the Ten Commandments and, uh, you know, and maybe we can quote them from memory. I know that's one of the tasks on your communication card is to go through and, and uh, memorize those. Um, but it's more than simply memorizing and it's more than simply knowing those commandments. One of the things that we're called to do as believers is to live out the implications uh, of those commandments within our individual lives and within our, our families, our church, and our society. And so these commandments have a much broader set of implications and applications than simply saying, well, there it is, I read it, and I, I, I know what it is. These commandments need to inform our daily lives. These commandments need to influence the decisions on how we work, how we spend our money, how we treat the people around us, and how we do everything about life that comes to us each day. These commandments are to affect life within our families and in our church family so that God will be glorified in his people. You see, I think that's one of the purposes of these commandments, is so that God will be glorified. We're going to look at that in a little more detail uh, here in a few minutes. And also that, his, that God would be honored among those who don't know him. So uh, it means then that these commandments, if they are to affect, affect everything we do, in our individual lives, our family, our church, and society, it means then that these commandments are foundational to life. And, and these commandments then are the moral and ethical foundation that should inform every part of our lives together. If these commandments are the foundation, then we need to connect them to the entire structure and life of society. Now, I'm going to quote somebody who's not real popular right now, okay? Um, but uh, the chief strategist for the Trump presidency is a guy named Stephen Bannon, okay? And s don't throw rocks, okay? Uh, but, uh, but I was reading a speech by him that he did in, in 2014. And Bannon made the insightful observation that many of the economic problems of our nation have occurred because we have separated our economic practices from their Judeo-Christian moral and ethical foundation. And he makes a great point that if we don't apply our economics to the foundation of ethical, biblical truth, we're going to really foul things up. Now that means then that one of the things that we need to do as a society and in our individual lives, is we are called to reconnect the house to its foundation, or we're headed for serious problems. 
Here's a house with some serious problems. You might say it's not connected to its foundation very well, okay? When Jesus taught the parable of the wise and foolish builders in his Sermon on the Mount, he said at the conclusion of, of that message that a wise builder understands the importance of a good foundation and builds accordingly so that the house can stand up to the forces that will come against it. He connects that house to a firm foundation. And Jesus said of that house that is connected to a firm foundation, he said the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And then he says, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Now, these Ten Commandments, then, are the ethical and moral foundation of our society. And so it's important, then, that we not only, as we said, know these commandments, we must know the implications of these commandments to our politics, our economics, our legal system, our personal morality, our relationships with each other within our society. We need to look clearly at these commandments and their implications to all of life, connecting the foundation to the rest of the house. If we are not connected to the foundation, then we're going to be floating in midair. Okay? It's kind of like that house uh, uh, on The Wizard of Oz. You remember, it's just kind of floating in midair. Well, if we don't connect to the foundation, our whole society is going to be floating in air rather than being established on, on a firm ethical and moral foundation. And as Christians, this needs to begin with us. If the church is the moral salt and light to a world that has been corrupted by sin and lost in the darkness of moral confusion, then it's imperative that the church bring a clear moral voice to our society, whether they want to hear it or not. And we are called then to live according to our own ethical system if there is to be any credibility to the message that we proclaim. So it means we need to live out obediently these commandments and their implications. So one of the questions then is simply what are the moral implications of these commandments? Today I want us to look particularly at the third and the fourth commandments. And, uh, and when we read that third commandment, the uh, scriptures say that we are not to misuse the name of the Lord. The King James says we are not to take the Lord's name in vain. And we hear that commandment and, and we think, well, you know, I've got that one covered because I, I didn't say a dirty word today. So uh, I must be an incredible Christian. <laughs> Wow. And we pat ourselves on the back. Uh, but when we look at the deeper implications of this commandment, we realize that it applies to far more than just the words we speak. Now that is one application to it. That the words we speak should glorify God. But the meaning of this commandment uh, is a warning. And literally, the, the word for uh, take, the Lord's name, the word for take literally is the idea of to lift up or carry the Lord's name. Now, that indicates something more than just, you know, I don't cuss, okay? It's something much more than that if we are to live out this commandment. Uh, It means that I lift up or carry the name of Christ every day of my life. That his life and his love and his word informs every aspect of, of this commandment. Now, if we carry the name of Christ, here is what God is saying to us as his people. He's saying, if you carry my name, live accordingly, that I will be glorified. Now, if we put it in a little stronger terms, 
we would uh, say, here's what God is saying. He's saying, don't embarrass my family name, okay? Don't do something that, that makes me look bad, okay? Maybe you've told your kids that, you know, before they go to school. Don't tell your teacher that we just had an argument tonight, okay? So just don't embarrass the family name, okay? And, uh, and so God is saying to us, lift up my name by the way you live. Don't profess to live for me when you are really living for yourself. And he says, empty professions are worthless. In fact, that's the meaning of the word that's used in the, in the King James when it says, do not take the Lord's name or uh, carry the Lord's name in vain. That word vain is a, is a word that is used to describe a land that is desolate and empty. It's a land that is void. There's nothing there. It describes a, a worthless and useless wasteland. God is telling us that as Christians, we are to glorify God by the useful, godly lives that we live and the beautiful fruit that we bear. We are to live in such a way that the name of God is honored. You see how this commandment applies to every aspect of life. It, it, it has far greater implications than what we normally would consider. The job of every Christian, therefore, is to make God look good. And if you have taken the name of Christ, that is your job description. Make God look good, okay? Live up to the name that you profess. Um, make your life look a lot less like a desert and a lot more like a fruit orchard. And that will make God look good. His practical righteousness is to be evident in our lives. Now, you know, sometimes we, we, we read that word righteousness and we say, well, yeah, Christ declared me righteous when I came to Christ, and I am declared perfect, and, and, uh, and, and so that's great. And, and that's good that God has declared us righteous, but one of the things that God desires in us is not only to be declared righteous and forgiven, but He wants us to live righteously. He wants us to discover practical righteousness in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, in, in verse 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what God desires in our life. If we are not to take his name in vain, he wants us to become the righteousness of God. And when people see that fruit of righteousness in our lives, they say, that's a Christian. That's a believer. That's someone who honors the name of God uh, in their life. Now, you go to the very next verse in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1, and there he says, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Now, the word in vain there is the Greek version of what you find in Exodus in, in the Hebrew uh, version, uh, or the Old Testament, and, and, and it's a word that, that means the same thing, empty says, don't receive God's grace in an empty way that doesn't produce fruit, that doesn't change your life, that doesn't transform the things that are important to you. And if you have taken the name of Christ, then don't take it in vain. Allow the power of the indwelling Christ to affect the, the way that you live from day to day. Now, let's go to Titus chapter 2 for just a minute, okay? little book of, of Titus in the New Testament. It's right after First and Second Thessalonians and First and Second Timothy. And in Titus chapter 2, we see this, this uh, call for Christians to live out a very practical Christianity in their day-to-day -day living. Now, if, uh, if you look at this passage, Paul is writing to different aspects of the family of families. And, and, and uh, in verse 1, he says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. And sometimes in the church, we say, well, well I'm going to teach sound doctrine. Great, 
But what are the implications of that? Are we also teaching what is in accord with sound doctrine? What is consistent with living out what we say we believe? And then Paul gets to some very practical things. He says, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. He says, likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. He says, then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure. Notice that's twice he's used self-controlled. To be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, he speaks to another part of the family of families. Encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. And so he goes through all of these aspects of the family of God, and he says, here's practical righteousness and how it is to be lived within the Christian community of faith. And he's very specific on this. Now, if, if we look at this passage, he says there's a reason for that. Um, in verse 5, he says, so that no one will malign the word of God. In verse 8 of this passage, he says, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. In verse 10, he tells believers to live consistently with what they profess so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12, Paul reminds the Christian community, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. That's practical living. Now, we see that when we take God's name, we have a responsibility to live in a way that honors His name. Paul writes to Christians in Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. In Ephesians 5, 1, Paul says that if we take the name of God, we should begin to live and act like Him. Paul directs Christians in that verse to be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children. So if you're a part of the family, he's saying, act like your dad, okay? If we're in a Christian household, act like Jesus. He's the head of the family. Act like him. In verse uh, 3 of that same chapter, Paul writes, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. You see the expectation of a clear difference. In verse 8, he tells believers that though they were once darkness, he says, Now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. That means there is an ex expectation to live in a practical way that honors God if we are to avoid taking his name in vain. If we are careful to honor and obey this third commandment, and if we profess to be a child of God, then we must live like a child of God. Our lips and our life must match. In Proverbs 26 and verse 23, you know, there the, the, the uh, Solomon writes, you know, like, like glaze over earthenware. Uh, our lips that don't represent the inner heart. You know? and, and, and so he says we have to be real. We have to be genuine through and through in our walk with Christ. If we fail to do this, then we are guilty of hypocrisy. And our words are only empty professions without any substance or reality to them. In that seventh verse of Exodus 20, he says, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God or take his name in vain. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, Jesus warned then of the dangers of vain professions that give no evidence of life transformation. In fact, he said, we will be judged for that. We will not be found guiltless uh, if if we are living a life in vain. 
you will not be found guiltless because you have abused the grace that God has given and poured into you. Now, if you pray but fail to obey, your prayers are useless, empty, and vain. You may profess to love God, but if obedience is absent, your words are void of any real meaning. If you love God, obedience is the visible proof of that love. If you profess to worship God, but He is really only one of many gods in your life, and your worship is only occasional at best, then your worship is vain. If you claim that you glorify God in all you do, and yet you fill your mouth with grumbling and murmuring, your profession is empty. And you are not shining forth the light of Jesus Christ. Instead, your words and your life must be the overflow of a heart that is filled with love for Jesus. Flowing from the deep, deep well of His grace. In contrast to the empty, worthless wasteland of sin, the scriptures tell us that the Christian is to draw from the well of the holy and fruitful presence of the indwelling Spirit of Jesus. That is what is to flow out of our lives. And when Jesus dwells within the heart of man, Jesus flows out of the heart of man. Jesus then causes us to overflow with his grace. And these are some, some phrases that we find in the New Testament. We don't have time to look at all of them. But here are some phrases from the New Testament that, that as Jesus dwells on the inside, it is Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus, who causes us to overflow with his grace, to overflow with hope, to overflow with thanksgiving, to overflow with joy and generosity, to overflow with praise, and to overflow with love for each other and everyone else. So check what is flowing out of the well, and you'll find what's deep inside that well. When our lives overflow in this way, we are making it clear to the world that our words are more than empty profession. And our lives are truly filled and overflowing with the character, the beauty, and the holiness of Jesus as we live out the full implications of this third commandment. Paul writes in Philippians 1.11 that we are to be filled with the fruit of righteousness. And if we are filled with the fruit of righteousness, then righteousness flows out of our lives in a very practical way. And he says that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. But there are some further implications in this passage that we read. And when we look at the fourth commandment, we see some implications. You know, uh, just as Jesus takes the worthless and fruitless desert of our sinful lives and turns it into a blossoming, blossoming fruitful garden worthy of his glory, so the natural response of a heart filled with gratitude is to turn our hearts to the one who has redeemed us. And we offer to him our heartfelt gratitude and worship. If Jesus has changed us, if he has caused us, our lives to be transformed, then worship flows naturally out of that life that is not being lived in vain vain or, or, or emptiness. Worship is therefore a consistent expression of the person who has been delivered from the power of sin. And this fourth commandment stated uh, in verse 8 of Exodus 20 tells us to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. It means that worship is to flow from what Jesus has done with us on the inside. As a redeemed people, it is only natural to offer worship to our Redeemer. As Israel was set aside to glorify God, so a day was set aside for the purpose of worshiping that one God. In our day as Christians, we have been set apart as a people dedicated to the glory of God. The scriptures tell us that we belong to him. He has purchased us. He paid for our sin. He purchased us out of slavery. We belong to him. And we are to be dedicated to his glory. And like Israel, worship on the Lord's day is an important expression of our recognition of who God is and all that he has done in our lives. 
And when we stop and look at all that, that God has done, then you see, we want to praise Him. Worship is not a burden. Worship becomes a joy of, of the person who realizes God's goodness in his life. And worship flows like, like, like a clear river out of a, a soul that, that is filled with the beauty of Jesus. Now, our problem today is that we have failed to remember that as God's people, we are called to worship him. In fact, instead of setting aside a day for worship, we have sometimes turned the Lord's day into our day. When we forget God's day, we begin to live our lives as if God is not worthy of our time, forgetting that time is not ours to begin with. If you look at the next minute of your life, you only receive that minute by the grace of God. Every second of your life is a gift from his hand. That means every moment of every second is a sacred moment to be offered up to him, the giver of that gift. The violation of this commandment then points out also the depth of our sinful selfishness that we say, God doesn't deserve my time. God doesn't deserve for my lips to glorify him. We don't want to be bothered with something as burdensome as worshiping God, but we forget that this day was meant to be a blessing to God's people. It was meant to be a weekly reminder that, that God calls his people to stop working in order that we might start worshiping. That there's something more important than that nine to five job, six days a week, that we stop and think about the God who has given us everything. In verses 9 through 11, you see this, this, this uh, focus on the seventh day. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. God recognizes our need for physical rest and spiritual rejuvenation. So he gave us a day to accomplish just that. And it's time, uh, it, it is a time to stop and reflect upon our Creator, to think deeply about the life that He has given us. He wants us to understand that life has an ultimate meaning and purpose that only He can provide. It means stop and think deeply about, about God and who He is. He wants us to stop and realize what life is really all about. Without a day set aside to consider life as a precious gift from God's hand, we begin to think that life is our own to spend in whatever way we wish. I ran into one author who said, uh, there are six purposes of the Sabbath or the Lord's Day. Number one, it provides a regular time carved out of life to worship the giver of life. Number two, it provides a time to think and reflect on the truth of God's word to his people. Three, it provides a public witness of our full devotion and obedience to God. Four, it teaches our children that God is valued above all else. And every time you get ready on a Sunday morning, you're telling your children something. You are communicating a very clear message every time you know, you dress up a little fancier for a Sunday morning. You're telling your children something. Number five, it reminds us that God's universe can run without our help and that we can trust in his divine provision. Six, it is a declaration of the eternal Sabbath and God's kingdom that is coming when we will rest in the fullness of, of that kingdom. When we are told to keep the Sabbath, the word that is used here indicates that the day is consecrated and sacred, a day reserved for God. 
the writer suggests that the, that the word means uh, that this day is to be hedged about and protected as property entrusted to your care. I believe this day served as a reminder for Israel of the eternal day when God would bring about the fullness of his redemption upon the earth and upon the people who inhabit it. The Sabbath was regarded by the Jews as a sign that the new day and new age of God's kingdom would come. A day of peace, rest, joy, and liberty. The Sabbath was therefore a symbol of the future promised day when God would reign supreme over his redeemed creation. For Christians, the Lord's Day is a reminder that in Christ, the day of redemption and the kingdom has begun in us. We are the first phase of the kingdom plan. And we are being prepared as a people for that kingdom who will reign with him. One day Israel will also respond. But they have not yet responded fully. The Bible tells us that, as, that Christ is the second Adam and that we are new creatures. We are a people redeemed by God to love him, serve him, and worship him forever as Adam and Eve were intended to do back in the garden. That means we are a redeemed people set apart for the glory of God. In Christ, God is accomplishing the miraculous redemptive work of his second creation through a redeemed and forgiven people born again to delight in the worship of the God who has saved them. When God does a real saving work in people's lives, worship is never a heavy burden. In fact, the truth is that God's people delight in gathering together for worship on the Lord's day. Now, one of the things I've noticed over the years is that when we forget the importance of that day of worship, you know, I can usually predict that there are going to be some problems on the horizon. Without worship... There are about five things that, that happen. First of all, worship, without worship, our devotion and commitment to Christ grows faint. There's a spiritual dryness that begins to set into our lives. Sin begins to dominate us. Divided relationships occur. And disorder begins to reign. Whenever the God of order is absent from life, disorder (laughs) sets in. Wherever God is absent, chaos will begin to reign. That means we need God at the center of our life, or our life will become a chaotic mess. God has designed this commandment then to bless our lives, and we ignore it at our own peril. When we obey this commandment, the blessings of God begin to flow into our lives, into our church, and into our nation. A nation that worships is a nation that God can bless. The atheist and philosopher Voltaire, around the time of the French Revolution, once said, if we want to destroy the Christian religion, we must destroy the Christian Sabbath. Think about that. The enemy says, if I want to destroy Christianity, I simply allow everything else to crowd into a day that's set apart for God. In fact, uh, the French government at that time decided they were going to establish a 10-day week so that they could avoid the idea of a seventh day and not have a day to recognize God. They went to an extreme to avoid any concept of uh, of the Sabbath. The great evangelist of the 19th century, D.L. Moody, agreed with with the atheist Voltaire. And D.L. Moody stated, Show me a nation that has given up the Sabbath, and I will show you a nation that has the seeds of decay. A day set aside to honor God is a time of resting in God's sovereignty and sufficiency to worship the God who is fully capable of keeping the planet spinning without our help. 
It is a day that is to be set aside for extended prayer and study of God's word. It is a time for good Christian fellowship with other believers. In the early church, this day was used to gather, to hear God's word, to share a meal together. And they did it every time they gathered. And then they celebrated the Lord's Supper along with that meal every time they gathered. It was a time to encourage one another. And the church was not to ignore this day, but to set it aside as holy to the Lord. I believe that what God had set in place for the first century church, as old-fashioned as these commandments are, can still bless our lives and our church and our society even today. These two commandments remind us that our lives should show forth the transforming power of the gospel, proving that we are truly children of God, worthy of the name we profess, and worshiping the God who has made us worthy in His Son, Jesus Christ. If you have never turned from your sin to turn to your Savior, I invite you to do that today. Come to Jesus Christ in a very simple prayer of faith and say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I confess that I have lived my life in disobedience to your holy commandments. And Lord, I need to repent of that. And I need to realize that my Savior Jesus Christ took that penalty for my sin upon himself. And he died in my place the death that I deserve. Perhaps you've never made that decision. I encourage you to go home today. Maybe tonight before you go to bed. Simply kneel at your bed and say, Lord, I need you. I don't need religion. I need you. And the Bible says that the uh, Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus comes and indwells us and brings us life and fruitfulness and transformation and a set of new priorities. Perhaps you profess the name of Christ, but you're not living in a way that lifts up and honors his name. Your lips and your life do not match. God is calling you to repent of your vain profession and your sins that still entangle your life. He is calling you to quit playing games and to get serious about relating to him as your heavenly father. Jesus died to open up the relationship with your heavenly father. He wants you to love him with all your heart and mind and soul and strength and to be done with the pretense of hollow professions and empty worship. He wants you to daily live out the implication, implications of these commandments, living for his glory and praising him for his grace. The more we become like Christ, the more we prove that our profession is real. And the more we become like him, the more delightful and perfect our worship will be. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your great love. And Lord, as children of God, we have taken your name for our own. You have put us into the family of God, the household of faith. And Lord, we take the name of Christ as a common name to each of us who have received you as Savior. But Lord, I pray that we would honor that name, not just by the words we speak, but by the life that we live, that you would be glorified in your people as we lift up the name of Jesus, as we lift up the Father, that the world might see that there is truly a redeemed people that lives life differently from the rest of the world around us and that they would be drawn to the love and the life that they see within the people of God. We pray, Lord, that in our hearts that we would move from the aspect of, of worship as a burden and that, Lord, you would make your worship a delight to our souls. That, Lord, on our way to worship on a Sunday morning, that our footsteps would be light, that we'd be singing a song, that we would be looking expectantly to meet with Jesus as we gather together as the family of God. Lord, bless 
the truths of these two commandments to our hearts and to our lives. We thank you, Lord, for the implications of these two commandments. Apply them to our lives that you would be glorified in all of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a kid, a uh, long, long time ago, uh, you know, we had a saying on the playground when someone would, uh, you know, they'd call your name and then they'd call it again and maybe they'd call it a third time and you weren't paying attention or something and finally you'd turn to them and you'd say, well, well yeah, that's my name, don't wear it out. And, uh, but Jesus says, you know, we're to lift up and honor his name. That is a part of living the Christian life, that we glorify his name in everything we do. There is nothing in life that is not to glorify him. And he is worthy of every bit of this life that he has given to you. Honor his name. Glorify his name. Remember to worship and glorify him with other believers. And he is deserving of all the glory that we can give and far more besides. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you, Lord, for the, the love within the body of Christ, within the family of God. And Lord, you tell us that that supernatural love, Lord, is an evidence that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Lord, let our love go deeper and deeper and deeper that we might draw upon that well of your perfect love. Lord, let us manifest your grace and your goodness with everything that we do in life. Bring to us, Lord, the fulfillment of the righteousness that you have declared us to be. Let that become a practical righteousness in our day-to-day -day living. Lord, go with us now as we go from this place and may we together, wherever we are, lift up the precious name of Jesus. In his name we pray.